Oh, my siestas are getting shorter and shorter. Hey, Michael, mi amigo, pay attention, it's show time. Welcome to a voyage of discovery and awareness of the richness, the diversity, and the often surprising nature of living with the land. Well, chef, everything okay? Hey, they're hoping, hoping, their machine in is going, they're flumey, flumey. Exactly. If you had wings, had wings, had wings, if you had wings, had wings, had wings. May I have your attention, please? Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, you are approaching the new global neighborhood. Now that you've seen the future, we invite you to experience it yourself. W, w Radio, your information station. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the WDW Radio Show, your Walt Disney World information station. I am your host, Lou Mangello, and this is show number 297 for the week of October 20th, 2012. I'm here to help you have the best Disney vacation experience possible with this podcast, videos, blog, live broadcasts, in-person events, my Walt Disney World trivia books, audio CDs, and much more. You can find everything over at www.radio.com. So I like to look at Walt Disney World in terms of layers of the onion meaning that beyond the enjoyment of the parks and resorts, as you dig deeper and peel back some of those layers, you uncover some amazing details and stories. And while they may not be apparent at first glance, by learning more and understanding the meaning and purpose in everything you encounter, you'll ultimately have a much richer experience. So this week, we're going to stop by the residence of one of Disney's Hollywood Studios' landmarks and take a look at the story, both real and imagineered, of Sid Coenga. Answer the Walt Disney World Trivia Question of the Week for your chance to win a Disney prize package. Then stay tuned for the announcements at the end of the show, including information about a new contest, upcoming events and live broadcasts, and much more. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this week's episode of the WDW Radio Show. As I'm sure you know, if you've listened to the show in the past, one of the things to me that makes Walt Disney World so very special and truly magical is the attention to detail that the artists and the Imagineers and the cast members put into everything that you see and do. And it's all about story. Uh, story sometimes that is obvious, sometimes story that you have to dig a little bit deeper into the layers of the onion to discover. And I think one of the places where that's done so very well is over at Disney's Hollywood Studios. It's rich in history, both real and imagineered. Uh, it's evident from the, step, the second you step foot through the gates. And again, this is one of the places that has details and stories that go back to that golden age of Hollywood and that golden age of Hollywood that never was. And today I am back live at Disney's Hollywood Studios with my good friend and author of The Vault of Walt, Jim Corcus, to talk about one of those locations that, again, is rich in history, rich in story, real story and imagineered story, and incredible details as well. And so, Jim Corcus, I want to welcome you back to the show. And, and I've just got tears rolling down my eyes, not just because I'm so happy to be back with, with Lou, because Lou's such a good friend and uh, be able to share stories with all of you, but... We've been digging into the onion pretty deeply today, and and so you know, I, I guess you got to dip an onion in cold water or something before you peel it, so you don't cry and all of that. But yeah, I'm I'm, I'm happy to be back here to uh, talk about the 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 real and imagined uh, story of. Uh, uh, Sid Kuanga, because it's uh, always a, a favorite of mine. What would you like to know, Lou? Well, so let's just sort of go back first, because we've done shows in the past before where we have strolled down both Hollywood and Sunset Boulevards. We talked about how much of it was inspired by real Hollywood, by real Los Angeles, where you came from. So you were able to help connect a lot of these places, whether it's the facade of the dark room or the Max Factor building mm -hmm. or whatever it may be. To real locations in Hollywood. Now, as you stare down the Hollywood Boulevard, especially when mm -hmm. the Chinese theater was at the end of it, when that was, was that was that visual weenie, it really helped paint a picture of Hollywood in the 20s and the 30s and 40s 
We've talked about how Buena Vista Street in uh, in Disneyland now and California Adventure paints that that vision of Los Angeles when Walt stepped foot uh, off the train there. But when people walk through the archway here into that replica of the Pan Pacific Auditorium and past the crossroads of the world, we always say half jokingly about how we lament that they're they're looking down at their maps or they're running down to get on Toy Story to get to Tower of Terror to get to Rock and Roller Coaster and don't take the time to appreciate a lot of those details and, and that those journeys that we've taken through Hollywood and Sunset I think have helped not only complete the story but help people recognize some of the details but one of those stories and again there, this is one where there's a real story there's a Disney story and there's a, a real history to it is here at Sid Coenga it's this sort of building that looks so out of place on Hollywood Boulevard which has all these art deco stylings to it and these uh, signs for uh, the Hollywood you know glitz and glamour so let's sort of take a look at Sid and I think first and foremost people walk by they say Sid Coenga's they either don't know who or what a Sid Coenga was, where it came from, or there are sometimes these uh, these legends of, of Sid Coenga, where that name came from, that maybe we can help clear up for people. Well, uh, and of course, uh, Sid Coenga is uh, an imagineered uh, name, but it, but again, it has that basis in reality. That's why uh, the story of Sid Coenga has always been confusing, even to cast members, because uh, the imagineered story has so many true elements of, of Hollywood that, that they get, you know, they get mixed up. But let's start with, who is Sid Coenga? It, it, it sounds like, it almost sounds like it's real. It almost sounds like it's real. And again, it's because that's uh, refer- referencing some um, emotional memories of Hollywood. Of course, Sid, and especially the way that it's being spelled, references uh, Sid Grauman who was the entrepreneur for uh, Grauman's Chinese Theater, of course, uh, the Egyptian Theater. He was quite a showman. In fact, in, in 1941, he actually got an Academy Award from, uh, uh, for his showmanship, for changing how films were uh, exhibited. So it became a, a major uh, production. Sid, Sid Grauman is, is the person that uh, Bob Cobb created the Cobb salad for to sober him up when he was when Sid was drunk. Uh, so the he Sid, was having dental problems. He was having he dental, dental problems. <laughs> yes. See, there's all sorts of stories, and uh, so so that's where the Sid comes from. And Coenga, and and you've been out in in Hollywood, uh, uh, Lou, so you know that uh, Coenga is is a street that cuts right through Hollywood Boulevard and. And on Coenga, you have uh, the Hollywood Bowl. And, and, and again, Coenga is, is first a funny-sounding name, you know, uh, uh, you know, would pop up in a lot of comedians' routines like Cucamonga, you know, and Coenga and, and all of that. And, and, and again, it's a Native American name. And combining the two together, Sid Coenga, it, it creates that, that feeling of, of somebody who might have been from the Hollywood of, of the Golden Age, of the, the 30s and the 40s, but, but of course was completely fictitious. But, you know, what I said, one of the first things I think people notice about this building is, is that it looks very much out of place. And, and throughout, especially the, the Echo Lake area and Hollywood and Sunset, we see the, uh, the Art Deco stylings of that time period. We see references to original buildings. We see that, that California crazy. But this California-style bungalow almost looks as though it doesn't belong here. But this is something that, that you would have seen uh, very early on, especially you know, in the early days of Hollywood. Yeah, th- this is very much in the in the style of uh, the craftsman style, which was popular at the time. And a lot of people forget that, that Hollywood uh, began as, a, a, as a, a community, a residential community. And in fact, as we follow the timeline of uh, uh, Hollywood down uh, Hollywood Boulevard, as we did on a previous uh, uh, podcast, of course, it's got to begin with it being a residential community, and that's what this is. But uh, but some of these still are um, there in Hollywood uh, it's, itself. You know, the, uh, this uh, uh, building was not based on an actual uh, uh, building. I've I've heard cast members literally tell me that this was a, a replica of Sid Coenga's house. So, uh, I, I even had one cast member tell me that they 
moved Sid Coenga's house from Hollywood to here. And that's, that's we've already established there's no Sid Coenga. Get out of here. Um, but what happened is uh, a lot of the early uh, residents, uh, as Hollywood was building up around them, decided to retain their, their home. I, I think one of the most uh, famous ones, which is clearly a reference... Uh, uh, even though it's built in a different style to this house, is the Janes house, where the Jane sisters were living on, on Hollywood Boulevard. And basically they said, we were born here and we're going to die here. So even though real estate investors, uh, you know, offered tons of money, they, they kept their house right up until uh, they died, which was in the, in the uh, 80s. And um, uh, sometimes times were tough, so they had to rent out the front lawn as a, as a parking lot. Sometimes... Uh, uh, they had to uh, rent out uh, space to outside vendors or to have a yard sale or, or whatever in order to, to keep up, you know, as, as the uh, taxes for that land, you know, started to uh, increase. Um, Jeff Curdy uh, wrote in his uh, book, Since the World Began, that one of the references was a house on uh, La Brea, uh, which was a luggage shop. And uh, just maintain that, even though Hollywood grew up uh, around that. So, so this house is very much uh, to represent uh, that Hollywood began as a community, and that even as Hollywood continued to grow, some of those residents felt they needed to maintain the house. The the Jane's house uh, is now uh, uh, still preserved in a, a little area on Hollywood Boulevard, uh, a mini mall, I think, called Jane's Square. Uh, so that people can visit that. So, so this is very much in keeping with that philosophy, which, again, there's enough truth in there that people go, oh, yes, oh, oh, of course. <laughs> but, but there's enough fantasy as well that this is uh, purely a, a, a Disney creation. But like so much of what we see that is uh, imaginary stories, there is some basis in reality, there's some basis in truth. Even when they create backstories to some of these things. And look, a place like Sid, and, and this is why I love having you on, and some of the things I like talking about on the show is there are so many backstories to restaurants, shops, buildings, whatever it may be, and there's an entire backstory here for Sid's as well that is sort of based on those real stories of these people that moved from the Midwest and came to California, and they built their bungalow, and, you know, I think about Carl Fredrickson from up, you know, mm-hmm. the city sort of grows around him, and this guy is the last holdout. And that's sort of the, the story of this fictitious Sid Coenga backstory as well. Uh, yes, and, and the, the backstory is basically that Sid and his uh, uh, wife Rosie came from Chicago, or, although uh, sometimes it's supposedly Omaha, basically anywhere from, from the Midwest. Interestingly enough, the, the story was not officially written down because uh, a, a lot of the story was created through um, uh, early Streetmosphere, which, which was a series of improvisations where, where the performers themselves were invited to contribute to the story. So we can talk about that a little bit later. Because right, you always say that there is no great big book of Imagineering that has all these stories in it. There's no sort of Imagineering Bible of, of backstory. No, there, there is. There should be. There <laughs> should be. There should be. I, I've been looking for it. Um, but uh, basically the story was, yes, uh, Sid and Rosie moved from Chicago somewhere in the Midwest uh, to come out I- in the uh, early 1920s, and, and they built the, the small house, and of course Hollywood grew up uh, uh, around them. Sid was offered uh, a tremendous amount of money to sell. He didn't want to uh, sell in order to um, uh, help pay for you know, the, the mortgage and the house taxes. Had a uh, would have yard sales, and in fact, we still see some items out on his lawn and and uh, around there. But he found that in in the yard sales, the things that sold the best was the movie memorabilia that he picked up, you know, uh, along uh, uh, the ways that, that studios had thrown out or or friends had come by and 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 dropped by, and uh, uh, sometimes even celebrities themselves would come into the shop to buy something and Sid would allow them to uh, purchase things by signing an autograph that he could that he could sell for more money than what the item was that uh, this uh, uh, celebrity uh, uh, wanted and so it, it started to um, uh, expand uh, uh, from there and so uh, again we're, we're seeing a physical representation of that of and, and again I sort of miss you know it, it, it just makes me sound like a an old man, you know, oh, in the old days, this is so much better. Um, but when the park opened in, in 89, 90, there was a plethora of um, 
uh, movie memorabilia. There, there were at least 30 different uh, photos of, of Walt that were studio portrait photos, which were out of the ordinary ones that you, you could get. Uh, there were press books that were sent to movie theaters to publicize uh, uh movies that were being released. There were items of uh, clothing and, and things that had actually touched the, touched the stars. There were movie posters. Now it's, it's primarily an, an awful lot of uh, autographs, which is, which is fine. There's certainly a market for that, and uh, uh, I, don't, I don't begrudge people buying that, but, but I, I miss some of that authentic, one-of-the-kind stuff that, that uh, used to be in here, and, and a lot of that was... Uh, uh, Excess props from uh, from Disney live action films, uh, and they and they still have some for more current films. So you'll see mm-hmm. things like from Spider Man Three. We saw the Sopranos, and there still are a few that remain that I think are more of um, that are more for browsing than they are for buying. Uh, so listen, I would love to have one of Bert's jackets from yeah. Mary Poppins. It's probably one of ten or so that they probably made that the hero yeah. jacket for Bert. I don't have an extra sixty-five thousand dollars laying around, but they do have ones that range down into the fifty, a hundred, two hundred dollar range as well, too. Listen, you have listeners who love you. As soon as they hear this, somebody will send you and want your uh, measurements so that they can sew you a Burt jacket so that you can use it for the next big meet and greet uh, event that uh, uh, that you do. I would probably fit into a penguin outfit. So uh, when they're working with. Uh, uh, that we we can uh, uh, go with that, and uh, of course we talked about uh, the fact that you know there's no set story, and one of the reasons is because um, the storyline was concurrently uh, developed with uh, what was called uh, streetmosphere, and uh, of course in the 1930s and the 1940s in movies you did not have extras, there were no extras in those movies, there were atmosphere people. That's what they were called. And, of course, since the atmosphere people are working out on the street, they are streetmosphere. Now, how this all developed was um, back in 1977 uh, in Orlando, an improvisational theater group was created called SAC Theater. That's where uh, Wayne Brady got his, um, his early training. And so uh, one of the founders was uh, Craig McNair Wilson. And when Epcot opened... In 1982, see, we're going to tie this into uh, to the Epcot celebration coming up. Um, they needed some entertainment to fill in because some attractions were not ready. People forget that uh, Spaceship Earth kept breaking down and Universe of Energy kept breaking down. Journey into Imagination Ride didn't open until, you know, March instead of October. Uh, so you needed something to fill. So they put in um, a, a Commedia dell'arte troupe in, uh, in Italy where a bunch of performers, improv performers, would bring in the guests and involve. It became so popular that uh, the crowd became so big that people in the back of the crowd could not even see the stage. They, they just wanted to hear what was going on. And so Disney asked uh, uh, Wilson, you know, uh, how long would it take uh, to create, you know, another show for maybe the U.K.? And uh, Wilson said, I can have it up by Thanksgiving. And so by Thanksgiving, there was another. And so for eight years, the show ran there until Disney decided, well, we can do this. And they took that over. But uh, anyway, during that time period, Wilson was brought in to help develop characters for um, the Adventures Club in, in Pleasure Island, but also for the, the studios here. And remember that when Disney MGM Studios was being built, there was that controversy that Universal was building at the same time. So Wilson went and visited um, Universal Studios uh, Hollywood, where they had walk-around characters, but the walk-around characters they had were like uh, uh, Charlie Chaplin, Groucho Marx, uh, Lucille Ball, Marilyn Monroe. And, and he could see that even at that point in the 80s, uh, there were people who were Just didn't uh, recognize didn't re- or resonate with anybody. Didn't sure. re- didn't re- especially with with the younger people, and that that was only going to uh, uh, increase. And so it made more sense to come up with um, unique characters from that same time period. You know, iconic characters like you know a, a, a cowboy western star or a film director or. Uh, a girl who just got off the bus who wants to break into the movies, whatever. And um, so using the uh, improv techniques that he developed uh, in SAC Theater, 
uh, and input from the uh, cast, and they watched movies from the 30s and 40s and all that. They developed names. They developed uh, personalities. Uh, they developed uh, scenarios that they were going to operate with. But uh, Wilson also decided to stack the deck. And he pulled in, and this is an exclusive for the Lou podcast. You won't find this in print anywhere else. Uh, to stack the deck, he pulled down uh, one of his old uh, acting cronies from uh, uh, Minneapolis, a fellow by the name of uh, Al Arasim. And, and Al was a, was a big guy. He was about, you know, my size, so he, he pretty large and, and more of a used car salesman type personality, whatever. And so he was going to be the first Sid Cuenga. And... Uh, Al only uh, lasted a couple of months because, again, performing in a theme park is different than performing on stage or performing in movies or TV. It, it takes a different mindset. It takes, you know, a different type of preparation. But, but he was the opening one, so he's the one who appears on, for instance, uh, uh, the USA Today newspaper. Now, a very funny uh, uh, story is that, uh, first off, Jeffrey Katzenberg didn't like Streetmosphere at all, didn't like Sid Cuenga because... Um, they didn't interact with a lot of people. They only acted with a a small number of people. And so uh, Wilson had to prove to him, and he he did later through guest surveys, that just having that small interaction was sometimes more powerful than a major ride like, uh, uh, you know, uh, the the big movies ride and the great movie ride and, and, and all of that. And that was the memory that would drive, you know, future attendance. Well, um, Eisner was always a supporter of the idea of Streetmosphere. He thought it was fun. And a couple of days before the park officially opened in May 1989, um, Eisner was, was walking the streets with this entourage, and, and he's pointing at places, you know, that needs more paint, we need to move that out of the way, that needs to be fixed, you know, all, all of those uh, uh, type of things. And, and Wilson uh, was always a, a troublemaker. He, li- he liked to stir things up and uh, especially with improvisational theater, like the, the confrontational type thing. So uh, Al Arasim's there in costume as Sid Cuenga, and Wilson pushes him out into the pathway of, of Eisner. And so Al goes, uh, uh, Eisner, Eisner, it, it, it's great to see you. I, I've been trying to get a hold of you, you know. Uh, I, I thought you were going to send us the, the uniforms from uh, Good Morning Vietnam and, and the baby clothes from uh, uh, Three Men and a Baby. You know, I need stock. All of this stuff is, is constantly, you know, being sold out and all this. And so Eisner, you know, wants to establish that, yes, he's a fun guy. He's a playful guy. He gets it. He understands, you know how all of this operates. And so he goes, oh, Sid, Sid, yeah, I've just been so busy with this other stuff. I'm going to get back to you. You're going to get that stuff. And he, and he moves on. Well, uh, one of the people in Eisner's entourage is scribbling away. And sure enough, a week later, showing up at the studios is a box filled with uniforms from uh, Good Morning Vietnam and baby clothes from Three Men and a Baby. So they labeled them, tagged them, and, and uh, sold them in... Uh, uh, Sid Cuenga's here. Now, um, Al didn't last uh, uh, very long. As I said, he went back uh, up to Minneapolis. He did a, a, a film. And so uh, they wanted to, to fill that uh, position, and they had the perfect person. They had hired uh, an entertainer by the name of uh, Danny Dillon. And Danny had a long career as an impersonator, uh, uh, very famous, very popular. He did impersonations of like Bing Crosby and Stan Laurel and George Burns and all that. All the same people that people, just like, yes. like Lucille Ball, people have no idea who people they are. People have no idea who, who they are, which I actually, I'll, I'll bring this up a little later, I actually saw that happen on the street. Um, but um, so he took over and basically for 16 years did, uh, did the character, uh, which is why uh, uh, people call him the one and only Sid Cuenga. But an exclusive on Lou's podcast, Al Arasim did it for a few of the early uh, couple of months there. And Danny took an entirely different tact because Danny had been hired. Uh, there was going to be a, a show on the, the back lot, you know, where they do the special effects now. There was going to be a show. He was hired for that. And then he was also hired to perform in the Brown Derby. So he was going to do impersonations. He was going to do some singing. His wife is a singer. His wife is uh, Pam Brody, who does the... Uh, uh, singing over at the uh, Rose and Crown at the UK Pavilion at Epcot. In fact, I think she still does it uh, uh, two, maybe three days uh, uh, a week. So anyway, uh, Danny w- and and Danny was uh, a lot 
how do we say this politically correctly, more mature than the other <laughs> Disney Streetmosphere performers uh, who were who were hired. Uh, he, he, ha- he had a, a, a good another two decades or more under his belt than, than some of these people. And so while the other Streetmosphere uh, performers developed routines where they interacted with uh, each other, they even practiced those. Um, uh, backstage, so when they came out on the street, it looked spontaneous that they were going uh, through this. Uh, Danny was sort of a, a lone wolf, and so uh, he was allowed to hang around uh, the front of Sid Cuenga's, go up and down uh, Hollywood Boulevard, sometimes even go into the Brown Derby. And yes, I, I saw him on the street doing a, 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 a Bing Crosby impersonation, best one I'd ever seen in my entire life, and two little kids standing next to their mother going, Huh? Bing what? What? <laughs> Who? And the mother's just laughing. Mom, why is that funny? We don't understand why that's funny. And so, um, unfortunately, Danny uh, uh, passed away uh, uh, from cancer in about, uh, I think, 2005. And uh, there's his photo up there inside. Uh, you know, as you go in, right to the left on, on the wall there, there's Danny's autographed photo as, as, as Sid Cuenga. And around are photos uh, saying, to Sid. And, and you've got... Uh, Russell Johnson from Gilligan's Island, and you've got uh, you know the Batman cast, and you've got uh, Al Lewis, Grandpa from the Monster. Yeah, yeah, there you go, there you go. Share, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> mature performers, and um, uh, somebody was trying to explain to me, oh, those those were actually autographed to Sid Grauman, and I said, Sid Grauman passed away in 1950. <laughs> it, you know, if, if the cast of Batman wanted to sign it to Sid Grauman, I, I I think you know, there's something wrong there. What are they smoking on the set? But uh, that's in there. And um, so, uh, you know, uh, Danny really brought uh, that character to life. I I think occasionally uh, Michael Marzella uh, filled in. Do you know Michael Marzella? Huge, huge guy. And I say that being a huge, huge guy myself. You're not huge. You're fluffy. (laughs) (laughs) I am. I'm an Ewok. I'm not fat. I'm fluffy. (laughs) I'm I'm an Ewok all grown up. There's more of me to love here. Um, but uh, Michael has the had he probably still has I haven't seen him in years wonderfully deep you know voice of God type voice so he uh, he did the uh, narration voice for uh, uh, the fireworks show here you know when when they had the big inflatable uh, sorcerer Mickey uh, he also performed in in a lot of the TV series that were filmed out here like uh, Thunder in Paradise you know with uh, Jack, they filmed in Morocco, and and so he's, he's playing a Moroccan character there with the, the, this voice. Uh, I I, I'm, I think Michael uh, filled in a couple of times when either Danny was sick or was pulled away for a con- convention gig or whatever. But uh, I, I think it's safe in saying that when Danny says he's the one and only, that's pretty much true. If you do a character for about 15, 16 years, you own, you own that character. <laughs> I, I, I think I think I think that's pretty much it. That you know. A lot of people have played James Bond. A lot of people, have, you know, uh, he played he played Sid Quenga longer than Sean Connery played James Bond. So we'll uh, we'll we'll go uh, with that there. And um, he, uh, again, the fictional uh, Sid Quenga would have to uh, occasionally uh, replenish, you know, because once you s- sell memorabilia, uh, those of you who sell on eBay can, can see that <laughs> that once you sell it, it's gone. Right. And so if you see it being sold for something higher or whatever, oh, I wish I had another one of those. Well, that's too bad. It, it's gone. So uh, the fictional Sid Cuenga, uh, right outside uh, uh, his uh, bungalow, is the uh, big black truck where he will go out and uh, uh, go to various um, uh, studios to uh, you know, pick up items from the dumpster or studios, gave him items, whatever. Uh, two items that uh, Disney fans may particularly love is in the back of the truck is they have uh, uh, one of the diver figures from uh, uh, the long-lamented Magic Kingdom 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea and one of the treasure chests. Mm. So you can take a look at that, and uh, uh, maybe sometime Lou will run a a contest of can you identify the other props in there. I I will tell you that I I took another look again today, and... Yeah, that's familiar. I know I've seen that somewhere. That's obviously got to be an extra, or that got pulled when a rehab happened. But uh, I'm not 100% sure on, on uh, uh, a lot of those there. And, and again, so Al Arasim developed a, a little bit of uh, the background story of uh, 
uh, Sid, but uh, Danny, uh, you know, even even more so. And uh, well, well beloved, a very nice guy. When I first came out uh, uh, to Orlando, and uh, I was put in the entertainment uh, department, uh, Danny sat with me and talked with me and said, "Okay." Jim, this is what they're going to tell you. This is what really happened. So do this, do this, do this. So uh, wonderfully delightful. And and we just uh, went inside and uh, took a look at the shop, right? Yeah, and I think part of the reason why I like sort of setting up the story and look, you know, having a walk around character for uh, a building like this, I think is great, especially because mm-hmm. somebody like Danny can really make it his own. He's given a framework, but he sort of makes who that character is. But once you understand what this building is meant to represent, when you walk inside, you get a sense, you understand that, hey, that behind those pictures is a fireplace because these these are the front rooms of Sid Coenga's home. This is Sid's house where he is now selling these items not just on the front porch, not just on the lawn, and he has some very interesting lawn ornaments out here as well too, but this is his home, and now all of a sudden you see that they are different rooms. That story that Jeff Curdy talked about, about what this building was early on, you see pieces of luggage inside. You make that connection to what those things are. And you're right, there's some fascinating items in there and that are not just for sale, but help sort of bring that whole story of Sid Coenga full circle. And and I like the fact that it's one of the, the few places at Disney Parks that still sell books. <laughs> uh, it, 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 you'll notice that uh, most of them now are Disney books. But uh, again, when it opened in uh, 89, 90, a lot of them were old uh, film books as well, too. But uh, we're getting to that generation now that is not uh, familiar with that. Uh, you know, one of uh, Michael Eisner made a suggestion that in Brown Derby that... Uh, most people don't know who those caricatures are anymore. If, if I asked you to name a, uh, your favorite Ad, Adolf Mangio film, I, I don't know whether... Uh, well, there's so many, I, Jim. I don't know whether I could come up with just one that I love. And, and so uh, Eisner had even suggested that they change out all the caricatures so that they're more current. He suggested people like uh, uh, Schwarzenegger and... Uh, um, Stallone and, and all of that, you know, e- even before Planet Hollywood came up, you know, to, to do those. And, and, and again, now you, you have that uh, battle between, you know, what is authentic and what is, uh, you know, what is going to be entertainment. And that's always going to be a, a, a battle. Uh, I, I, I was just working on a piece on um, uh, Kingdom of the Sun, which was a film that uh, later developed into uh, Emperor's New Groove in entirely different tone, uh, different styles of characters, whatever. But one of the things that was slowing down Emperor of the Sun is they were really trying to make it uh, authentic to that that time period. And so they wanted a cart, but because of the time period, um, the Spanish hadn't come and introduced the wheel yet. So do you put a wheel on that right. cart or not? And so the producer uh, said, finally, it occurred to us, we're spending days debating about this, and we're not making a documentary here. We're making an entertainment. Shouldn't we be worried about what type of story we're telling, and is this going to be effective, rather than worrying about, is this authentic to to this? And and again, there's always that, that balance. I feel that the more authentic you can be, uh, it adds that flavor. It, add, it adds that uh, 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 flavor. I know, for instance, the Doge's Palace at uh, um, uh, the Italy Pavilion. I know that that's not marble. I know that's fiberglass, but it's been marvelously painted to, to be marble. I know that uh, the Campanile, which is the bell tower, is actually on the other side of the Doge's Palace. Uh, in, in Italy, it doesn't bother. It doesn't me. ruin the experience well, it, because it's authentic right. enough that it's like, yes, I get it. But it's it's sort of that double-edged sword, and we were alluding yeah. to this offline earlier. So for something like the uh, the paintings and the the uh, the caricatures and the silhouettes in the Brown Derby, my feeling is those need to remain like that because the Brown Derby and this area of Hollywood Studios is meant to capture a certain place in time, and. Yeah, when we see things like Disney Channel rocks moving up the stage, it is it is disruptive to that story. But for ninety nine point nine percent of the people here, they're not worried about the integrity of the story. They're worried about having fun, having a good time, seeing something that is familiar. So, in that case, I'm okay with it. Whereas inside the Brown Derby, 
I would want to preserve the integrity of that golden age of Hollywood. And you know what? For my kids, when they go in, I'll say, hey, that's Laurel and Hardy. And then they look at me and they're like, are they guest stars on Phineas and Ferb? I say no. And, <laughs> and you sort of explain to them who they are and sort of educate them. And so I think that's what you have here at Hollywood Studios, whether it's about Sid or the facades or the stories. You have an opportunity to educate people about a time that they might not otherwise be familiar with. Because now you're, you're, you've got not a book that they have to read, but you have a, a set that's in three dimensions. Well, and, and again, you know, you can always talk about should there be a compromise. So there are some separate dining rooms there uh, at uh, Brown Derby. Should those be the authentic pictures and then you update? Or is it going to bother people eating their Cobb salad and seeing... In the Will, in the Will Ferrell room? <laughs> yes, or, or the Miley Cyrus area or the Demi Lovato area. Uh, and, and, and again, how quickly... Uh, some of these stars uh, are are forgotten. Uh, Haley Duff, at one time, you know, uh, huge, huge star uh, uh, for Disney. Miley Cyrus, huge, and and today Haley Mills, huge. <laughs> yes, you know, and and today not not as as, as well known. You know, uh, it, it, what's frightening to me is um, we were talking earlier about uh, TV series that we like to, to watch. I like a lot of the same ones that you do, like uh, Walking Dead, and I watch Falling Skies. And uh, I, I get a big kick out of those ones where it's the end of the world and how are you going to survive? Because I know I wouldn't last five minutes because I don't know how to uh, hotwire a car or how to create fire by clicking two rocks together or whatever. But but, but, but I like seeing how other people uh, uh, do this. But uh, uh, two very popular series that I loved, uh, Lost and uh, Heroes, you know. And uh, when they were on the air, I, I couldn't go anywhere without people talking and, and, and having ideas and uh, assumptions and, and all of this. And now it's like, well, that's dead and gone. And, and it wasn't that long ago that they were on the air, you know. And... Um, so things come and go very quickly. I, I think some stars always remain. I, I, I think a, a Cary Grant will always, a Marilyn Monroe will always be, um, you know, iconic. Um, and people should know. Kids sure should learn who they are. Look, this is this is the Tomorrowland conundrum, right? Do you try and keep Tomorrowland or Hollywood Studios or the Brown Derby updated to what's current and what's popular, or is that meant to represent a, a certain place in time? And uh, the other story I, I shared with you earlier, I was in uh, Dayton, Ohio, and this uh, uh, 22-year-old uh, uh, young lady came to me. And, and if you're listening to this on, on Lou's podcast, you really are adorable. You really are uh, uh, adorable. You're way out of my league, but you really are adorable. Uh, she came up uh, and wanted my autograph on, on a book, which was very kind. I'm, I'm always very flattered and taken back when, when, when people ask that. Um, but she was so excited, obviously excited about Disney, and her birthday was coming up, and she said, well, and, and my parents, I'm so excited, my parents are taking me to the theatrical stage production of uh, Mary Poppins. And so as, as I sign, I, I like to talk with people, you know, keep the conversation going, and, and I said, oh, and, and have you read the book? And she said, it was a book? I said, well, actually, there were several books, and I said, they used some of those elements in the, the theatrical production. She said, no, I, I just thought it was based on like a, a really, really old movie. And I had to bite my lip, and then I had to realize that, by golly, this is, Mary Poppins premiered almost 30 years before she was born. And so we, we've got a whole generation now that, uh, actually, I'm very surprised that we, we don't have a whole generation that is really eager to bring back things like uh, DuckTales and... Uh, uh, rescue Rangers and Tailspin because they I think grew there up are with some. That. I think there's a lot of people that, and now because now you see the shirts, mm -hmm. we've got this new renewed nostalgia in the parks. You see those shirts coming back. Quick aside story, similar <laughs> to yours. I was in, um, I was out with my kids the other day, and there was some of the trivia boards like you'll find out in mm -hmm. front of SIDS where you can answer 10 trivia questions to get a little magical moment certificate. My daughter answered the question right about Alice in Wonderland, and I was talking to the cast member about the old Disney film. She goes, Oh, yeah, I wish they would bring back. Some of those real old classics, you know, like Aladdin and Little Mermaid. And, and when she explained she was born in 1992, I just, I drowned my sorrows in a 
carrot cake cookie. But that's beside the point. Um, I hope you told her she was adorable. <laughs> even, even though even though she made you feel as if you know you you were uh, should have a cane and a and, and a beard. Well, and, our classics are yeah. Snow White and Pinocchio and Peter Pan and. Her classics are, are from a different generation, but anyway, back back to <laughs> well. I, see, I, I would argue with that because I've I've got a seven year old nephew who I, I I love dearly, and and of course when he when I I babysit him, I I always make sure to fill him up with lots of M and M's and Coca Cola before I give him back to my brother. But one of the things we do is we go through Uncle Jim's uh, film library, and so I show some of the early um, Disney animated features, and one of the wonderful things is is they're so timeless, you know. For for him, it doesn't make any difference when Pinocchio w- was made. This is the first time he's seeing it, and as far as he's concerned, it's a it's as new a film as as Ice Age Four or whatever. <laughs> it, he loves the characters, the story works for him, the 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 whole bit. But I I think a culture as a whole, we're we're starting to lose uh, that sense of history, and and I hate to say this, you and I I, I think uh, keep a little young because we deal with. With younger uh, uh, people, uh, uh, a good friend of mine who we both know, but I won't say his name because this might be embarrassing to him, uh, was on the phone and I was was talking to him because I was helping him with a, with an article, and uh, I, I said, "Boy, and 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 you're the snooky of Disney historians," <laughs> and um, he said, "Who's that?" I said, "Have you never heard even of the word snooky?" No, I said. Look, he's there's a better a, person for it. Whoever the, <laughs> there's a cultural IQ. You have to have a cultural IQ. You have to know at least that there is such a thing as a Kardashian. So if it, it comes up in conversation, you can nod your head semi-knowingly. You know, uh, with that. But but I, I I think maybe we're just so overwhelmed with with so much uh, information. And and again, one of the things that you pointed out, you know, only the listeners of, of this podcast and and you and I are interested in the story of uh, uh, Sid Cuenga, you know, because when we come back to the park, that enriches the experience. We we see more and more new details that are uh, supporting that story, and it, it makes us smile. And and I think it also gives us almost that sense of ownership. Uh, you know, of, of being uh, in the park and, and, of course, being that uh, Disney expert for, for friends and family. But as you pointed out, 99% of the people, they don't care. And, my gosh, why would I go into Sid Cuenga's? There's no vinyl ma- Maybe there should be a, a Sid Cuenga <laughs> no vinyl mation. There you go. We've got to get Casey Jones and Monty uh, on the Sid Cuenga they, vinyl mation. You know, eventually they're going to run out of vinyl mation. <laughs> you know, they should do a Clark Gable uh, vinyl mation. They should do a uh, William Powell vinyl mation, you know, th- things like that. I, I think you might be surprised at uh, uh, the people who, uh, who would uh, uh, pick that up. But, uh, you know, even just in the time that uh, you've been out here in Florida, I'm sure you have seen massive changes in, in the parks. Not just, well, attractions coming and going and shows coming and going, but in terms of the attitude towards the park uh, itself. Well, I, I think, you know, we talk about this sense of nostalgia and classic and change. I think we're in a great place because there's, there's a, a great dichotomy that goes on here because I think... From the entrance to the end of Hollywood and down Sunset, that story of the 20s and the 30s and 40s that's being told there can and should remain like that. Whereas once you start going down towards Commissary Lane and uh, the ABC Commissary has advertisements and billboards and stories and food that is themed after some of the shows that are on there, you are able to sort of keep it updated for an audience that is looking for that connection to things that they are familiar with. Look, when Lost was out, they had Lost props in there. They had Lost, And they still have props from uh, Modern Family, some of the ABC shows. So you're able to sort of get that break for those of us who love this rich history, the story that's being told here of Hollywood, and then that family that wants to enjoy things that there's a sense of familiarity and uh, a modern relationship with. Well, and, and I think it, it really comes back, you know what a huge fan I am of Walt Disney, and, and the more I study him, the, the more I am just absolutely amazed. And, and I think one of the amazing things is what we're discussing right now is Walt was able to find that proper balance between uh, uh, nostalgia and uh, current and, and, and future, you know? They, they, they always use that, that expression that Walt had one foot in the past and one 
foot in the future. That's why you have a Main Street and you have a Tomorrowland. And, uh, and neither seems to detract from the other. You know, it, it, it creates that, 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 uh, that balance. Uh, and one of the things that I'm excited to, to see, you've, you've been out there, you lucky guy, you, is uh, Buena Vista Street at, at uh, Disneyland. You, you that said, same kind of thing, right? Where you've got this nostalgia, where, which, which is all about Walton in the early 20s, but right around the corner you have Cars Land. And one does not necessarily impact or detract from the other at all. They can coexist in that same park. Yes, yes. And, uh, yeah, so I'm looking uh, forward to going out there and immersing myself. More so in the, the uh, Walt of the, the 20s than Cars Land, even though I have heard nothing but glowing things about Cars Land. I have, I have heard not one little uh, uh, speed bump. And, again, it goes to show you that when Disney does something right... They do it right, um, so uh, good for them. I'm, I'm glad. I, I, I want uh, uh, Disney to succeed. I'd, I'd love this. Uh, uh, I love this park because it's so intimate. But I'd love it to to, to succeed. And uh, it bothers me when when I have uh, friends who say, uh, "Oh, Disney Animal Kingdom, that's just a half day park." What? You're, you're, you're not looking at anything. What, what, are you, what are you doing? What are you doing there? Physically, it, it, geographically, it's larger than all three parks out here put together. And, and yet, for you, it's just a half-day experience? I'll refer people back to, my, to the show I did where I made my argument and I laid out the plan for Animal Kingdom being a two-day park. Mm-hmm. Think me crazy? Possibly. But um, I think that certainly is the case. But look, to, to sort of bring things full yeah. circle and t- talking about... Buena Vista Street and this section of Disney's Hollywood. Do Studios. they have a Sid Coenga on Buena <laughs> Vista? Do they have, do they have one out there? They don't have a Sid Coenga, but what they have is what they have here, which is a relationship back not to Los Angeles in 1923, 1925, yeah. where you'll see it in the buildings, but great story. Relationships back to early Disney films, early Disney animation, certainly uh, to Walt himself and Walt's family, and that's what you have here. You've got this real, historical sense of these bungalow houses that existed in Los Angeles and these Disney-created stories that are tied back to some of those uh, things that you would have found during that time, but is completely Disney fabricated. And I think that's the great balance that Sid Coenga's, this section of Hollywood Studios, and this park, especially Hollywood and Sunset, really delivers is that great marriage of a uh, story that's both real and imagined. And, and I want people, and I'll post some photos from inside and outside Sid Coenga's in the show notes over at www.radio.com to give you a sense of uh, what I want you to look for. But I'm not going to post everything because I want people to come in, Jim, and explore and look around and see what they can discover about some of those details that we are just sort of trying to introduce them to. Well, and they may even have uh, photos of uh, being with Danny, or they may have photos of what uh, Sid Coenga's looked, you know, back in 89, 90, and, and they might even have a photo of Al Arasim, who, who knows there. You know, all of you who are listening out there, all of you uh, can be Disney historians. Every time you come to the park, you know, take those photos, you know, document everything that you see. Save those guidebooks. You'd be surprised. Some of the most valuable things were things that people threw away because, oh, well, everybody has one of these. You know, this isn't going to be valuable. I'm going to talk. And and now people would kill to have early guidebooks from those early years of, of Disneyland, you know, because you could confirm names of shops. You could confirm times of, you know, when it was open, what was happening, what was going on. Uh, So all of you out there, it's up to you to keep the stories alive, and it's up to you to keep the story alive of of Sid Coenga, because it's even being lost today uh, to cast members, because it's not in the operating guidelines of the the shop, Um, nor probably should it it be. You know, you want to get on with things. But I I think it's just nice. It's that uh, uh, cherry on top of the ice cream sundae. And, And, Lou, thank you again, as always, for having me on the show and and you have some of the nicest listeners uh in the world and i say that not only because they buy my book the vault of walt and uh, bring it up to me to sign and uh, some of them listening right now are going to go right out and buy that at amazon.com and and bring it to me uh to sign um 
but because genuinely they are, and 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 they love. I, I'm hoping that you know you sell books, you sell CDs, all of that. I'm I'm hoping uh, possible merchandise in the future is uh, a lock of loose hair, so that we can keep it in a little cameo around our necks, you know. And 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 eventually one of these days maybe clone our own Lou, because obviously you've done that to do all the things that you do. But thank you again, Lou. Jim, thanks for coming on. Thanks for sharing these stories with us. And the question I want to leave for listeners is, obviously, Sid Cuenga sells all this uh, movie memorabilia and autographs from your favorite stars. If you could have one thing from Sid Cuenga's, whether it actually exists in the store or not, a piece of Disney movie memorabilia or a Disney autograph, uh, something signed by a Disney star or an author or Walt, what ideally... Would you like to buy? What would you want to bring home from Sid Cuenga's? Leave it in the comment section for this week's show over at wdwradio.com. Very curious about what to, what uh, what you guys think. And I'm going to have Jim leave his item, his sort of uh, holy grail item of Disney movie memorabilia in the comment section. So they- Absolutely, because I saw some great things at uh, the Disney Family Museum up in San Francisco. And again, if you get a chance, go there. But they, for instance, they had Walt's reading glasses. They, they, they actually had the little brush that Walt would use to color his hair dark <laughs> before he went on, uh, on, on, on camera. You know, and uh, Ray Bradbury, uh, when Walt Disney said, you know, what can I do to, to help you for all the help you've given me? Uh, Ray said, "Open up your vaults and let me pick twenty things." And Walt and Ray Bradbury picked twenty things from the Disney <laughs> vaults, but we're only limited to one. What is that one thing that you would want? Maybe it's something from a, a movie. I know that one of the things that Dave Smith has desperately been trying to get for many, many years and didn't is the uh, harmonica from Escape to Witch Mountain. The the young actor who played that, he still has that, and he says maybe when he passes away, that'll go to the. To, to the archives. Would you want Walt's uh, birth, uh, birth uh, not birth certificate, but the, uh, the uh, application that he forged for uh, uh, going in, in, the in the Army? Do you want something, Walt? Do you want something from a film? Is there a, a particular film that, that just touched you so much in your family? Oh, my, you've just opened up a Pandora's box. Is it a signature? Is it an item? Is it a tangible thing? I want you guys to comment. It would be a very interesting conversation to keep going there. Um, so I think what we need to do now yeah. is really immerse ourselves in this Hollywood history and go dine where the stars used to dine. Ab, ab, but boy, giving this tough question here, <laughs> this, this is like a Sophie's Choice question here of, you know, which child do you, you not know, take? You know how many kids have no idea what Sophie's Choice is, right? Uh, yeah, I, I know, I know, I know. But they're still adorable. They're still adorable even though they don't know that. Lou, thanks so much, and I look forward to the next time we get together. Thanks, Jim. It's time for our Walt Disney World Trivia Question of the Week, where you can test your knowledge of Walt Disney World history or trivia. Maybe see if you can identify where a line from an attraction or a song may be from and play for a chance to win some Disney prizes as well. Before we get to this week's question, let's go back, review last week's, and select our winner. So last week's question wasn't necessarily about Walt Disney World history or even the details, but it was really more about story. So your challenge for last week was simply to identify three Walt Disney World attractions which, according to story, you travel through time. And once again, congratulations and thanks to the hundreds of you who sent in entries this week. The answers I would have taken and was looking for were things like Spaceship Earth, where you travel back through time, Dinosaur, where you go back to the Cretaceous period, Ellen's Energy Adventure, also where you go back in time, and Carousel of Progress, Primeval World, even Pirates of the Caribbean. Now, some of you said Main Street USA and other locations around the parks weren't necessarily attractions per se, but kudos, and I gave you credit for those as well. And I was also pretty liberal about taking some extinct attractions like Timekeeper, and a few of you made some very good go-with-me-here suggestions and arguments as well, too. So, you were playing for all six of my audio walking tours of Walt Disney World, a WDW Radio luggage tag, button, and also a WDW Radio embroidered logo hat. 
So I randomly selected one winner from all of the hundreds of correct entries. And last week's winner is David Keating. David, congratulations. Thank you for playing. I'll get your package out to you right away. If you didn't win last week, that's okay, because here's this week's Walt Disney World Trivia Question of the Week. So since we're talking about Sid Coenga's this week, we're going to stay at Disney's Hollywood Studios and look at some of the other older layers of the onion. Disney Junior, live on stage, is in a location previously home to Playhouse Disney Live. That show replaced one of my and my kids' favorite shows in the parks, which was Bear in the Big Blue House. Now, that show opened in June of 1999 on Soundstage 5 in a location which formerly housed a restaurant that had a number of different themes, including Big Business with Bette Midler, Beauty and the Beast, and Aladdin. So your question of the week is, what was the name of that restaurant? So the name of the restaurant that once occupied the space, now where Disney Junior Live on stage is, and again, where Bear in the Big Blue House and Playhouse Disney Live was. You have until Sunday, October 28th at 11.59 p.m. to get your answers into contest at wdwradio.com you'll be playing for all six of my audio walking tours of the magic kingdom a wdw radio luggage tag and button and a special mystery prize so good luck and have fun That's going to do it for this week's show. Thanks again for taking the time and tuning in this and every week. Don't forget to visit the website over at www.radio.com for our blog, videos, discussion forums, and lots more. Be sure and enter the Our Home Went Disney Halloween Contest. Entries are due Wednesday, October 24th. If you decorated your house with Disney this Halloween season, enter for a chance to win. Also be sure to follow me over on Twitter. I am at Lou Mangiello facebook.com slash Lumangelo. You can find all the ways to connect with me and the show by visiting wdwradio.com slash connect. Speaking of ways to connect, while we may be friends on Facebook or Twitter or Pinterest, I still think nothing beats a handshake and a hug. So visit our events page on the website to find out about upcoming live events, including our next meet of the month in Walt Disney World. It's going to be Sunday, October 28th at noon. We're going to have brunch over at Disney's Art of Animation Resort. The Little Mermaid section just opened up that final phase. So maybe we'll eat something, get a chance to meet each other, and then maybe walk around the resort a little bit. You can find that and other events both on our events page at the site and on Facebook as well. And if you're joining us on the WDW Radio Cruise on the Disney Dream in just under two weeks, be sure and check out the Cruise Update page over at www.cruise.com. There you'll find an updated itinerary, frequently asked questions, information about our door decorating and flag contests, our pajama party, and our new raffle on board ship. We'll have a chance to make a donation to the Make-A-Wish Foundation of America in exchange for raffle tickets. You can drop them in the boxes for a chance to win Disney prizes, collectibles, merchandise, and experiences. I'd also love to hear from you, so you can call the voicemail at 407-900-9391. That's 407-900-9391. You can comment or leave feedback on the show. Maybe just call in from the parks just to say hi. You can also email me at lou at wdwradio.com if you have a question for the show. Also be sure to join us every Wednesday night at 7.30 p.m. Eastern for WDW Radio Live, another great way that you can be part of the show. I do a live video broadcast where we talk about this week's Walt Disney World news and you can ask and answer questions, leave your comments live in the chat room as well. I want to thank my partners and sponsors, including mousefantravel.com. Whether you're going to any Disney destination around the world, they can give you the best possible prices, all available discounts, all at no cost to you, but most importantly, an incredible level of attention and personal service. Again, visit them over at mousefantravel.com. When you're coming down to Walt Disney World, you can stay at an all-star vacation home by visiting them over at allstarvacationhomes.com. Two-bedroom ho- condos, up to seven-bedroom homes with private pools, spas, kitchens, game rooms. Great way to b- bring and spend some time with the extended family. If you're coming down to Walt Disney World in the next few weeks to catch the rest of the Epcot International Food and Wine Festival, I highly recommend you checking out the Disney Food Blog Mini Guide to the festival that includes a schedule of events, booth crawls, touring strategies, what's new, dates and locations of your favorite chefs, seminars, and lots more. 
And if you use code WDWRADIO over at DFBGUIDE.com, you can save on the downloadable guide as well. If you can't get to Disney World as often as you like, Celebrations Magazine over at CelebrationsPress.com. You can subscribe and order back issues there. You can also download it via the iTunes Store directly to your iPad as well. Finally, my friends, and you are my friends, whether we have met yet or not, all I ask is that if you like the show, please help spread the word. Let others know about it. Tweet out that you're listening. Share links on Facebook or Pinterest, Google Plus, or your favorite Disney discussion forums. And please come by, rate and review the show over on iTunes. Very, very much appreciated. Very helpful as well, too. And finally, I want to thank you all again for not only taking the time to listen, but letting me share my passion with you. And I hope that you have the opportunity to do what you love each and every day. Don't wait for those good things to happen. Get out there. Create your own happiness every day. Get out there. Get started. I promise you'll be glad you did. And always, always keep moving forward. Thank you so much again. Have a great week, everybody. So until next time, see ya. Hi, Lou. This is Sam from Minneapolis College, and I just wanted to – I'm actually calling about a show that was uh, three weeks ago. Um, it was um, an interview with Marty Scalar, and I just wanted to say how much I loved it and how much it has really stuck in my mind because I remember at one point um, Marty had said that he began working at Disney doing, for PR, doing PR for them, and I am actually a – advertising and PR major who wants to work for Disney someday and to hear that one of the most legendary Imagineers at Disney started his career as um, working as a PR person is just the most exciting thing for me because it's really just getting even more pumped up about my dreams of working at Disney which I am currently you know working towards it's stuff like that that just keeps me going when I have really tough times in college so um, I just wanted to say that and that I love your show. Look forward to it every single Monday. And um, just give me my dose of Disney while I'm at college. And I'll be down there in about three weeks for the opening of the Fantasyland expansion. So hopefully I'll get a chance to meet you sometime while I'm down there. Um, hope to see you soon. Bye. Hi, Lou. This is uh, Tony from Illinois again, also known as Backside of Water in the Box. And... I know it's been a while since you uh, did the Best Lounges episode, but I was listening to it again, and uh, when I was at Disney World last month, I I got a chance to go to the River Roost Lounge, and it was the first time I ever been to a Walt Disney World Lounge, and it was just amazing. It was the the best time I ever had in that kind of environment because Yeehaw Bob was performing and his high energy show and I was exhausted just watching him. I can't imagine how he does that as much as he does. But and I would have never never even known that he was there if it wasn't for your podcast on lounges and the uh newscast you did from Yeehaw Bob show, so I want to thank you so much for that. That was the one of the best times I ever had in Disney, especially not in in a uh, park. So thank you for all you do and keep up the good work and I will see you on Wednesday. Bye. You go.